Welcome to episode number four of Soccer Coaching Theory and Innovations. Today what we're going to talk about is rapid skill acquisition. Basically, how you learn technique in soccer, how you should probably coach technique in soccer, kind of the place that it has in your trainings, the place that it has on player responsibilities on themselves, and maybe some different kinds of technique and, and that you can learn um, through YouTube, off videos, compared to technique that you learn in diverse environments and constraint-based environments and so forth. So first of all, um, we look at you know, how a, a soccer player can best learn technique. And for me, it's something that's called rapid skill acquisition. And we're gonna go through everything that's involved in how a player just starts from knowing zero of the technique and then how they learn it in small pieces and then how they put it together and then how they, they put it into a whole a whole skill and then they, how they take that skill set and eventually hardwire it into the subconscious brain and eventually the body gets hardwired and they can do that skill automatically and they have strategy behind the way they do it. Now, for me, it, it really depends what we're talking about here. When, when I was growing up, I didn't have too many like spectacular soccer players that I grew up with that I could learn technique from. I didn't have many coaches who could show me the technique. What I did have is I, I had a few videotapes and I had access to Soccer Made in Germany on, on Sunday mornings. So I would watch, uh, I remember watching Herbert Vogelsinger and he had a book on how to kick the ball long. Like, not a book, I'm sorry, a videotape, VHS videotape. So I learned how to drive a ball, watching his step-by-step, -step, how he drove a soccer ball over maybe 50, 60 yards, right? So he taught a couple different ways to kick a ball, and I literally studied that videotape, and I tried to do what he did. Um, for me, that's a, that's a big part of learning technique. Who are you gonna learn it from? And now, in today's world, it, it's a little bit different because information is free, and what's available to the players now to access is really extraordinary compared to what we used to have. Um, now this brings us to the point of isolated technical training, right? Is it something, say you're gonna learn direction changes, is it something that has to be done at practice? So I, I know a ton of you have seen the Corvair videotapes, you know, the, the, the Dutch coach who, who Put an emphasis on 1v1 moves and so forth and he come up with and he came up with this great training method but is that something that the players need to do at practice right and my answer to that my opinion is it depends if your players are really motivated and if your players um have brothers or sisters or friends that are really good technically and they can learn from them i i would say no i would say that Technical training in practice for the most part, especially in the young ages, if they're getting it elsewhere, if they can learn elsewhere, then that's fine. Then your practices can come down to practices that end, that, that um, concentrate on decision making, player decision making, right? How many, how many times can you put players in an environment where now they have to use these techniques in a strategic way and they have to make decisions, right? Because that's one thing that players can't practice at home. You can't practice your decision making, your application of the techniques that you learn. You need other people to do that with. And unfortunately, some, some teams, you know, they practice once a week, twice a week. I think that those practices need to come down to decision making type of practices. Now, if you look at some of the academies in Europe, and Holland has been doing this for years, you know. 15 to 20 hours on the ball each player spends by themselves a week, which is a tremendous amount. And like I said, it all depends on the culture. I have coached Brazilian players who've played five to six hours a day since they were five years old, about 14,000 hours of playing and ball work on the street by the time they turned 14 years old. And those things are very important. Those things are, you can't replicate those things. So again, tactical and team training environments compared to just technical tra training. 
I, I am more for the team training environments and the isolated technique to be on the side. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't do it as part of a warm up, and it depends. Maybe, maybe part of that warm up, your emphasis is on focus and concentration. Maybe it's on coordination of movement. Sure, you could do technical rote training if you wanted to, that's no problem. But maybe if it's, yeah, maybe if it's game minus one, maybe you have a game on Saturday and you want to do as part of your, as part of your sprinting, as part of your quick explosions, you want to do a few uh, technical things and they have the kids explode off of that, no problem, it, it fits in. But um, I'm not necessarily saying that you really need to do rote training, rote training of technique and practice. Um, again, more decision making stuff. So we'll move on from here. Now, skill sets, when I talk about skill sets, when I'm talking about technical skills, it could be, it could be, I mean, the Corvair stuff, we'll just use that, 1v1 moves, learning how to shield the ball, learning direction changes, learning feints on the ball, all this type of stuff, those are pretty straightforward technical skill sets. You can have a technique sheet. I used to do this for players in one-on-one -on -one lessons. I have 60 one-on-one -on -one moves. Here, these moves are good for your physical body type. These moves go with kids who have quick explosion. These moves are maybe a little better for kids who are a little, a little slower, sprinters, so forth. So, so we'd have a variety of techniques, one-on-one -on -one moves and everything. That's, that's pretty simple. But now you have to say, are there techniques that people can learn as well that aren't so straightforward, that aren't on a piece of paper? You know, left volley, right volley, those are straight techniques. Are there technical things that you can learn in diverse learning environments and constraint-based learning environments, which we talked about in episode one and two? Uh, I'll just give you a quick recap. Let's, let's think about the kid who plays on the bumpy dirt field, whatever it is, for six years. They develop different skill set than a player who plays on turf for those six years, correct? And that's not a skill, that's a, not a rote skill, that's not a skill that that kid is practicing in between two cones and we're given ten repetitions. This is a skill acquired by an environmental constraint. And we can move on from that. I was watching 60 Minutes the other day, and they had a, uh, a story on a, a man who lost his sight. He lost his sight in his mid-40s or so, and he was an architect, and he continued to be an architect without the use of his sight. He developed a unique skill set. He used his other senses. His other senses increased so much that it made him a better architect. He was able to, to use his hearing, he was able to, his, his sense of touch to design things. Uh, he actually designed buildings for, for people who had lost their sight. But it was just an incredible story. And it was just kind of showing how a constraint or a different learning environment can create these wonderful skill sets in people. So I kind of want to make the difference there between just straight out technical skills and then those special skill sets that can be learned in those constraint environments and diverse uh, environments. Um, we'll move on to the stages of learning a skill. So the first stage of learning a skill is you have to see it, right? So you see it and you get an image of, hey, what did that look like? And what do you think kind of the key things of performing that skill are about, right? Then the associative stage, which is kind of a trial and error stage where, the, where it helps to have the feedback of a master coach. And then we move on to this autonomous stage when the player is really good and they can just execute that skill without having to think about it, right? It's eventually the level you want to get to. But let's look at this rapid skill uh, acquisition fundamentals. First thing that you want to do is deconstruct the skill, right? So break it down into component parts. And if we remember the book Bounce, or actually I think it was the Talent Code, how the music school would break every single thing down. So if you drove by the school and you could recognize the song they were playing, they were going too fast, right? Um, so you want to break down the skill, master each part of the skill, before you put it together as a whole skill, right? And every skill has a secret to it, right? There's something that makes that work, or there's something that you can change to make it your own. Variations can be made, um, so you're gonna 
break it down into parts, and then put it into whole, right? So practice in increments. This whole practice part is once you put it together, there's a natural rhythm that these things need to be carried out in. So whatever kind of pass, whatever kind of dribble, whatever kind of thing you're doing, there is a natural rhythm that your body goes through. So once you get to the part of whole practice, I would probably start to focus on the outcome instead of the internal, because during this, when you broke it down and you're practicing in chunks, you're actually thinking about each internal move. So, you're, so your plant foot is pointed straight, your ankle is locked, your follow through goes straight, maybe if you're kicking the ball, depends. Uh, that, that would be like a push pass, right? But after you put all those pieces together, when it's time for whole practice, I would focus on was the target that you're trying to kick the ball to, did you get it into the target? Because that allows the body, that's called an external cue, and that allows you to focus on the outcome of the technique, not the technique itself. If you miss the target, now you have to reevaluate and say, how come? And then you have to change it. Um, next, making the skill training challenging. So obviously as you're learning the technique, maybe you're learning it with Obviously, you start breaking it down and you start putting it together whole, but then you have to you have to do this in different environments, right? So now maybe you're dribbling if it's a one-on-one -on -one move and you're gonna dribble and you're gonna put a cone down. So the cone is space. The, the, the cone is now it's angles, it's timing, it's speed, executing that skill, having to perform it at the right time before you get to that cone. Next, maybe you, maybe you add like a defender, maybe a passive defender who's playing 50%, then a, then a full defender, and then, and so forth. So you, you increase the challenge, so your skill has to be executed under more and more uh, challenging, more game-like situations. So once you get to that, we start to talk about strategic understanding of the skill. So learning the how, the when, and the where to use the skill, and this is really the, the last part of it, right? So, you, so Liverpool calls it building the hard drive, right? So you're building the kid's hard drive, you're building the player's hard drive, so they all have this in their working memory, and it's getting hardwired into their brains and their bodies, but now they have to really know, how do I use this in a game environment? And this is where we're talking about decision making. And this is why I say, the more players get chances to use their technical abilities in, in game settings, whatever games you have, then they have to work on their strategic understanding of carrying out those skills, right? And that's very, very important. And listen, I mean, I was in, in the martial arts, I can remember listening to a guy talk about, yes, you can know the technique and you can give a perfect kick, right? But if you're in a real match, you might have to execute that kick from angles, from positions that you never thought you would have to. And those things you can't practice. Those things are found out in training, right? The fourth part, immerse yourself in the skill, right? So for me, this is, this is about practicing that skill, immersing that skill every day. And here's, here's what that means. If you're gonna learn a 1v1 move, Learn only that 1v1 move. Learn it for three, four, five days in a row. Practice it every single day. Be totally immersed in that one skill. Do not pick 10 1v1 moves. Do not pick 10 direction changes. Pick one. Hardwire that into your brain. Build that neuroplasticity. Build those neurons. Get those synapses going. Learn that one skill. Put that in your hard drive. And after you do that for a week, now that will be with you. And then start to strategically put that into when you play and so forth. But one thing at a time. Master that one thing, burn that into your brain, right? The engrams we talked about in, in, in episode two. When I was doing this, I can remember I learned two fundamental moves from a friend of mine back in the day. And one was, a, we called it a cap with the inside of the foot and one was with the outside of the foot. I practiced those two moves for hours and hours a day for two weeks straight. After that, I had it. I used it straight away in games, it was perfect. And that was my experience with total immersion into one skill set at a time. Self-correction, obviously this is a big part of the process. Um, 
self-correction can also, it can be from yourself, but obviously from a, from a, from a coach's standpoint, that's a good thing as well if you have somebody to kind of look at your technique and give you some pointers. Um, chemicals, two chemicals that are very important in, in learning technique that people don't really um, think about too much. One of them is BDNF, right? And basically what this is, is when your heart rate is above 70%, so when you're above 70% of your maximum heart rate, it is difficult to learn technique, especially when you have to use your executive functions of your brain to break down a technique you've never learned before, and it's very, very difficult. So if you notice, when you're jogging, if you're running, it's very hard to think about complex things, complex problems, but once you start to walk, and your heart rate goes under that 70%, it's much easier to figure out those complex things and you could think at kind of a, a higher level. Your, your executive functions could kick in. So if you're just learning technique, it doesn't have to be part of this circuit training that goes 100 miles an hour. No, technical training could be much slower. Now, once you learn the technique, no problem. Now we can, now we can get the heart rate up. We can use it under you know, maximum heart rate, whatever you want to do. I can remember listening to Bruce Lee who would say, I can do more in three minutes in my practice than you can do in three hours. And what he's saying is his technique was perfect. He practiced in a perfect way, right? Everything he did, he pushed the heavy bag, timing, wait for it to come down at a certain point, execute his kick, and then he'd relax. He'd self-correct, he'd think about it, and then he'd execute again. Three minutes, he said. He could do more in three minutes than you could do in three hours. So here's my advice about technique. If the players are motivated enough, set up a curriculum on the internet. There's some of them out there right now that are very good. Use the internet to learn your technical skills from the best players in the world. B, train one skill at a time and master it. Immerse yourself in that one skill. Don't try to learn 20, don't try to learn 30. Learn one at a time and perfect that one skill and then move on. Learn the skills from part to whole. Once you've learned it and you're gonna do the whole skill, use external cueing when the skill is learned. Like I said, an example of ex external cueing, if you're gonna learn a foul shot, right, you're gonna think about did the ball, your focus, did it go in the net? Internal cueing is, all the little cues of did you bend your elbow, did you bend your knees, did you follow through. At that point, once you're doing whole skill, worry about the external, worry about the end result. If the end result's not right, come back and fix it. But your body is meant to carry out a skill with a certain rhythm. And if you focus on the internal too much, you will destroy that body's internal rhythm. Um, most importantly, use the skill in group environments so strategically you could get that skill. You could start thinking about how can I use the skills in different ways. This is all about building the soccer IQ and the hard drive. Now, once the skill is learned and ingrained and you're using it successfully in practices and in the real game, you only need to practice that skill intermittently to stay sharp.